Secretary, dear guests, dear ladies and gentlemen, I am so really impressed that it's very hard to say even hello. Uh, we are very proud and very happy. Uh, it's really a great honor to host you here at the University of Warsaw. Uh, one of the most important politicians of the uh, 20th and 21st century, <laughs> who added value to our transformation. And uh, he, we are here on the very special day, and I do not have in mind the Women's Day, uh, but the anniversary of us joining the Atlantic Treaty. So I think that it's time to give floor to you. Thank you for coming, and we are really very, very proud. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, <laughs> let me say how delighted I am to be here. Um, I have been to Warsaw many, many times, but I'm really delighted to be in a university setting and to be here on that day honoring students that 51 years ago um, really pushed things and made a difference. I do think students make a difference. I was born in Czechoslovakia and it's the students that started the Velvet Revolution. And uh, in America, we are hoping that our students will really get more involved politically. And so this is a wonderful day to be at a university. Thank you for your kindness and here's to the students. Well, let's start the show, Madam Secretary. Let's go. Uh, the time is scarce, so we have to go really, really fast forward. Uh, you have devoted your book to the phenomenon of fascism, uh, something which should be eradicated from the planet after all those terrible experiences we had in the 20th century. And my question is, what went wrong? What we did wrong that the fascism is coming back? Well, I think that it's a very hard question to answer because I think that there were forces that were taking place in terms of um, kind of a sense of good things that had a, a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. And so I think that we didn't quite know how to handle the technology revolution. We didn't know how to handle the divisions <clears throat> between the rich and the poor in all countries. Uh, and <clears throat> there were, uh, I think, leaders in a variety of countries that were willing to take advantage of that division and rather than bringing people together, exacerbated those divisions. But one of the things that I do ask myself uh, generally, but also try to deal with in the book, is why this happened um, and what are the lessons out of it. And so I'm hoping, you know, some people think my book is alarming. It is supposed to be. Um, because I'm often asked if I'm a pessimist or an optimist. I'm an optimist who worries a lot. And so I decided it was worth asking those kinds of questions. Mm -hmm. Well, but uh, uh, in your book you, you write with huge concern about countries like Turkey, like Hungary, but I also noticed that, uh, well, there is also some, at least traces, uh, concerning Poland. And do you really believe that our country is also in danger of becoming uh, authoritarian at least? Uh, at least? Well, what I did, and let me just go back on something, because I was going to write this book no matter who had gotten elected in the United States, and basically observing changes in a variety of countries. Um, and I decided to go back and look at history. Uh, so there is a lot of history in the book in terms of um, fascism mm -hmm. and uh, Mussolini and mm -hmm. Hitler. And one of the, I won't go through all of this because I'm hoping people will read it, but, but basically that fascism came in uh, those two countries as a result of dissatisfaction with their situation, uh, the end of World War I. But the part that I think surprised me as I went through everything was that both Mussolini and Hitler came to power constitutionally. Uh, King Emmanuel turned over power to um, Mussolini and von Hindenburg to Hitler. And as I was looking at current uh, examples of uh, my concern for authoritarian governments, they were all elected. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that's something that most people don't think about. I actually call communists fascists, and they are the only ones that had revolutions. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, whether it's Turkey or Hungary, 
uh, or the Philippines or Venezuela, um, I really do think that we need to keep in mind that those leaders are elected because they theoretically are dealing with those problems in their society. So I decided that was worth pointing out. Mm -hmm. And what is it with, with Poland? Poland is being criticized by, even by Americans, uh, by European institutions, by European leaders, that the uh, level of democracy, the rule of law, is in danger in Poland. And how it's going to end? Well, I have to say that in my assessment and study of what has happened here, I was, and I wrote about this in the book, kind of concerned about the things that the PIS party did when it came in, in terms of being critical of um, the judicial system, of removing a lot of people, uh, being concerned in terms of what was doing, what they were doing vis-a-vis -vis the press. Um, and one of the things that I have tried to do is point out the characteristics of authoritarian governments. And the characteristics are that there is a disregard for uh, the Constitution and the judicial branch, that there is a disregard of the role of the media, uh, that there is a disregard for a lot of the will of the people and a lack of desire to cooperate with people of different views. So I, I specifically wrote um, what I thought were the characteristics, and then people can make their own judgments. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Maybe this is like that we have a period of <coughs> liberalism, there are some, you know, few years, maybe a decade of semi-authoritarianism, and then we'll get back, like a sinusoid, to old good democracy and liberalism in Europe. Well, I do hope that people uh, think about what has happened in mm -hmm. terms of uh, what happens when people are elected and then they follow some kind of a route that leads away from liberalism. What is very hard, I think, is that there are a lot of um, definitions thrown out without people thinking about it. Um, and I have been, you talk about liberalism, um, I am very concerned about Hungary, mm -hmm. uh, where all of a sudden there is this really crazy, what I, uh, oxymoron uh, name for illiberal democracy. How can you have illiberal democracy? Uh, and partially it is because it's a decision that there's majority rule and no minority rights. And democracy is about both majority rule and minority rights, so then you have some crazy term like illiberal democracy. And so I am troubled by that definition, and, I'm, and if you want to know what I'm really troubled by is that I heard that Warsaw will make, continue the path from Budapest. Mm -hmm. I think that would be a huge mistake. And, well, we, we have proofs that that's the way they, they, they go. Well, I, I think that people need to understand what it means. Um, I understand that Viktor Orban is coming here, mm -hmm. uh, and frankly, I wouldn't welcome him. So I think that uh, there really is a question about that. <coughs> no. uh, yeah, but in nowadays Hungary, there's no hunger. There is a, a huge development, thanks to European Union, <coughs> thanks to this liberal monster, uh, Mr. Orban is calling a European Union. Uh, so the condition of life in Hungary cannot be compared to the condition of life in Germany in the 30s. And in spite of prosperity, in spite of employ, uh, full, uh, well, not full employment, but in spite of lack of social problems, lack of severe social problems, in spite of openness, uh, Europe, they tend to, 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 to vote for, 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 for this party. Mr. Obama was also legally elected. Well, I have to say I should be asking you the mm. question because I find it very hard to believe given Poland's history mm. uh, and the way that, and we're celebrating uh, the 51st year of students understanding mm. that they didn't like the system. Um, I came here um, in uh, 1981 uh, and spent a lot of time with journalists. Um, I was fascinated by what was going on. I had written my dissertation on the role of the Czechoslovak press in 1968, and I wanted to know what was happening here. And the spirit that was so incredible, um, and then I followed very closely all the things that Solidarity had done, and, um, and then all of a sudden uh, darkness came, but it came back and Poland led it. That's what happened uh, after the fall, even before the fall of the wall. And we all look to Poland as a leader of democracy. 
And so I think one of the questions is what really did happen? Why did it happen? And I think that all our countries, whether it's the United States in terms of trying to deal with American past, we are all trying to figure out what has been the evolution of the democratic process. And we all have to ask ourselves questions, is what makes uh, a democratic country vote for somebody that has simple answers? Uh, to make Poland great again. Um, and, um, and, uh, and I just have been watching um, President uh, Trump uh, greeted Prime Minister Babic, who said he wanted to make Czech, Czechia, which I can't say, um, great again. It's ridiculous. I think that what one has to think about is not slogans, but solutions, and trying to figure out how to get people so that they're supporting and understand what their leaders want and vice versa, that the leaders are there to respond to the, the needs of the people and not kind of just sloganeer. So I am worried about what's been happening. I, and I have to say, uh, and maybe it was wrong, that I was part of the group of people that were totally euphoric about what was happening in this part of the world after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the dissolution of the Soviet Union. And I ask myself the question is, what is it exactly that happened in those intervening years that makes the people in, or the leaders of the variety of countries in Central and Eastern Europe all of a sudden take a different direction? I would love to know what the answers are. Uh, I'm chairman of the board of the National Democratic Institute. We had spent a lot of time here, and I think we need to ask ourselves, what is it that made people turn away from a route that was dedicated to democracy and freedom of the press um, and an understanding of the rule of law? Well, I was a child during the communism, uh, but I can remember that life was a little bit easier because you didn't have so many choices. There was a freedom now, and freedom sometimes a burden. Maybe this is the answer, that too much freedom kills the democracy. No. <laughs> but, but I think, let me, let's go that, back that, that, that's on That's my job to ask stupid questions. Uh, <laughs> to really go back much further. I think one of the issues has been the following. I think that something that has happened in all our societies is the breakdown of the social contract. Mm -hmm. And what had happened was that um, several centuries ago, uh, people gave up a certain amount of their liberty, um, their individual rights, in order to be protected by a government. What I think has happened as a result of changes in technology um, and jobs and a number of aspects of the negative parts of globalization, um, that all of a sudden the social contract is broken. Neither side is fulfilling what it is supposed to be doing, which is the government responding to the needs of the people. And the people, I don't think, have taken enough time to fulfill their responsibilities as citizens. And so maybe that's your basis about not enough, that freedom is difficult. Mm -hmm. What I think that we didn't understand in the period since the end of the Cold War um, is that it, some of the changes that have been put into place um, in many ways, I happen to think privatization happened too quickly in some countries. Um, there was not enough of a sense about that people, even under communism, did have a certain amount of security. It might have not been what most people wanted, but they weren't afraid every day as to whether they were going to be able to make a living. And I think we haven't fully adjusted ourselves in terms of trying to figure out how to have that social contract work and I hope that that is the work in the future. Mm -hmm. And the Trumpists or the Urbanists would say that, well, democracy is a flawed system and should be you know, reinvented or simply abandoned because, well, it shows its deficiencies, uh, doesn't work for modern words. Is it true that democracy doesn't work for today's world? Well, I happen to think that the only thing that does work mm -hmm. is democracy. But democracy is hard work. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that it requires the participation of the population and understanding it. And one of the things that um, I think we have had a tendency to take democracy for granted. Mm -hmm. So just yeah. in my own mm -hmm. family story, we came, um, I was born in Czechoslovakia. Uh, we came to the United States in, uh, in 1949 after communism had taken over Czechoslovakia. And my father used to say the following thing, which is, I hope that Americans understand 
that democracy is fragile and that they can't take it for granted. I think that's true of everybody. Democracy takes work. Uh, it takes the people being supportive and understanding, and I think we have taken it too much for granted. Mm -hmm. I understand. And let's talk about United States. Uh, we consider the United States as a beacon of democracy, well, the source of, of support. Uh, and now with Donald Trump, as a president, should we still trust the United States to be partner, to be true partner of, of Europe, of Poland? Of well, first countries? of all, let me say, Donald Trump was elected in mm -hmm. our system. Um, he did not win the popular vote, but he did win the Electoral College. And mm -hmm. I think it's important for us to recognize it. I wish he would recognize it, mm -hmm. and therefore then be able to uh, explain what the Russians were doing. So um, I, I do think, but I think the issue uh, is the following. Uh, I have, I, I think I'm probably uh, the most grateful American because of uh, having the possibility of, to grow up in a country with freedom. But I think I also, we were in office with President Clinton in the 90s, which was a period of great hope mm -hmm. um, and a sense that uh, America did continue to have a role in the world. President Clinton said it first in terms of saying we were the indispensable nation. I just said it so often that it became identified with me. But there is nothing about the word indispensable that means alone. It just means that the United States needs to be engaged. I think the problem at the moment is that Americans, led by uh, those who believe in President Trump, that we are being taken advantage of, that the United States is a victim of the international system. I think that's ridiculous. We're the most powerful country in the world. We are not a victim. And what I would like to see is America's leadership. I just was in, uh, at a conference in Marrakesh, uh, which was a conference on immigration uh, by the United Nations. It was led by a Canadian, Louise Arbor, and she asked me to come and speak. And I'm speaking, and the American chair was empty. The Russians and Chinese were there. The American chair was empty. I find it very hard to think about America being absent internationally because everything about my generation and life depended on the fact that America was present. And so I am very worried about this kind of uh, isolationist trend and going that Trump seems to be encouraging about the fact that everybody's taking advantage of us. Mm -hmm. And do you believe that this damage done by Trump's administration could be repaired in the future? Or simply America's place would be taken over by Chinese, Indians, other, well, growing empires? Well, I think something that's happening mm -hmm. is there's no question that the vacuum mm -hmm. that has been created by the absence of our leadership is being filled by the Chinese. Um, and they have a new theory, the one belt, one road. Mm -hmm. um, and they are supporting a lot of countries. I have been saying the Chinese must be getting very fat because the belt is getting larger and larger. Um, they had something to do with Venezuela, mm -hmm. for instance, or uh, supporting uh, some uh, ports and things in, in Europe. So I am worried about that. I am worried about the following thing, and I, I do spend a lot of time traveling and I'm abroad, is that, in fact, um, we, if there are six more years of this, then there will be structures created uh, where the United States is not part of the new infrastructure mm -hmm. that needs to be developed for the 21st century. So I believe that the United States needs to have a role, um, and I'm very glad, frankly, that our political season has begun so early. Uh, because there are many discussions that have to take place. And I think one of them has to be as to what is America's role in the world. Do we want to be a part of it? We are a very large country uh, with friendly neighbors, for the, uh, or had been, um, on the north and the south, um, and basically protected by two oceans. And so it's, it's relatively easy for America to say, let's not worry about the rest of the world. It's easier than for Poland mm -hmm. um, or countries that are in the middle of Europe. And so I think that I would like America to have a role, a responsible role, role with partnership. Now, one of the things some of you have already heard me say, but Americans don't like the word multilateralism. Mm -hmm. It has too many syllables and it ends in an ism. But all it means is partnerships, and that's the way I see America's role, and I hope that we can get back to that. All right. And let's talk about Russia. How to perceive uh, this state? Is it a threat? Well, it 
starting aggression against Ukraine, bombing civilians in Syria. But on the other hand, Russia couldn't handle the HIV epidemics. So it has a lot of social problems. Is this country really a threat uh, for the Westerners or is kind of, you know, Colossus on the feet of clay? Well, let me say, um, I, I used to be a Soviet expert. Mm -hmm. And I look at my library and I think, aha, uh -huh, archaeology. And then I've decided, <laughs> no, it's not archaeology. And one of the things that happened, I, I had a, a wonderful project in um, 1991 with an American company that was doing a survey of all of Europe. Um, and um, it was very professionally done. Uh, and there were um, questionnaires and things, but we also had focus groups. Mm -hmm. And I will never forget this focus group outside of Moscow. This man stands up and says, I'm so embarrassed. We used to be a superpower, and now we're Bangladesh with missiles. And I think that what has happened is Putin mm -hmm. has bought into that kind mm -hmm. of loss of um, greatness for mm -hmm. and, uh, and Russia, and he has, in fact, uh, shown that he can put Russia back on the scene. I think he has played a weak hand brilliantly. Uh, he's, he knows how to do that, being from the KGB. And so I think that uh, he has, in fact, inserted Russia back into the Middle East, um, in, especially in the last few days, in terms of the more that, that um, there's some confusion about America's Syria policy. Um, and also, what he is trying to do, he has a strategy. And the strategy is to divide us from our friends and allies by militarizing information, getting involved in elections, um, and in many ways trying to uh, put Russia back on the scene. You're absolutely right. They have an economy that doesn't work um, and a number of weaknesses, but he has appealed. And this is one of the issues that I'm very, very concerned about generally. I think uh, that patriotism is very important. Mm -hmm. Nationalism is very dangerous. And hyper-nationalism is especially dangerous. And there are too many countries and leaders that are counting on nationalism to get people to forget about whether their economy works or not or whether they have a constitutional system in order to say uh, the, the sovereignty, the nationalism aspect is the most important one. Mm -hmm. so, that is something that Putin has done in terms of dealing with a country that basically has very serious economic problems so that the man who's embarrassed um, won't be embarrassed when the Russians again have a functioning army mm -hmm. and are doing exercises not too far from the uh, border, the, their western border. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, one thing which is common to Mr. Trump and Mr. Putin is the despise of the European Union. And I'm sorry, what? The, 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 the spies of, of European Union. The yeah. Well, does, don't like European Union. And what do you think? Well, European Union has its problems, undergoes, uh, well, turbulent times uh, with the Brexit and, and other, other, other stuff like, like Hungary. But the, my question is, uh, what, will the, what will be the future of European Union? Would it collapse or would it well, be, well, grow into a kind of super state, a federation, United States of Europe? Well, can I kind of go back on mm. something, which is oh, that please. the institutions that we have been living mm. with, um, especially my generation, are institutions that were created at the end of World War II. Uh, they were trying to figure out how to deal with the crimes of World War II and trying to figure out what kind of institutions would work. Uh, one of my predecessors, Dean Acheson, was present at the mm. creation of a lot of these institutions. I think it's certainly true of the United Nations and the European Union that came out of the European, the coal and steel community and mm. um, the Marshall Plan in many different ways. And there really was the hope that the, ish, the, the, the behavior that led to two world wars uh, in the 20th century could be overcome by the creation of these organizations. I think that what has happened is that, I have said, people and organizations at age 70 need a little refurbishing. And so I think that one needs to look at what the European mm -hmm. Union has set out to do. Has it been able to do it? Um, what happens in terms of, I think it's, the European Union is very complicated to understand. Mm. Um, it is for an American Even in terms of a lot of presidents mm. and various uh, commissions and things. And I do think, but I do think 
that some kind of a, a relationship among European states uh, is very important and that I hope that the European Union can in fact represent a way that a community of nations uh, can exist with each other in Europe. And so as an American, um, I do think it's important to figure out um, what we can do to be supportive and not to um, undermine uh, an institution that could be very helpful in dealing with some of the problems that the Europeans are having. Mm. All right. And now is the time for the question from the public. Uh, we have about uh, 20 minutes, so three, four questions. Uh, Professor Kuzniar, uh, there's a micro coming. Uh, this work. Yeah. Professor. Thank Pierre. you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm so glad, Madam Secretary, to see you here at our university and to see so many people uh, around. And I remember last time when this uh, hall was so full of um, people. It was uh, some uh, six or seven years ago during the uh, Prince of Gerenek memorial lecture delivered by Professor Adam Daniel Rothfeld. And a very nice moment. And uh, I had, by the way, the chance to work um, under your and Professor Gerenek chairmanship uh, on communities of democracies uh, 20 years ago. Um, but my question relates to um, the, the problem, well, to the institution we are celebrating 20th anniversary of enlargement. And uh, do you believe, uh, Madam Secretary, that the uh, Atlantic Alliance may survive, may survive in, in its legitimacy and coherence once it is based uh, not anymore on uh, Article 2, community of values and principles, but on transaction, on business? And that's the present vision or understanding of the Atlantic Alliance both by the United States and Polish government. Well, I think that the question is what is the alliance really based on? Um, in terms of common values, um, that I think that is the very important part, is understanding our common approach on values. Um, and, and I think that we have to remember that in many different ways, that it isn't uh, just a matter of transactions, but also of the value system. I do think uh, that there are very important roles for the private sector and the public sector, but I think that our relationship um, needs to exist on the basis of a value system. Um, and, and I think we need to talk about that more. I think it's very significant to have a discussion like this in a university um, setting where I really do think that the uh, transmission of values is something, I'm a professor, that, that one hopes gets transmitted through study and understanding history and why countries come together. So I am very much into not transactional approach, but a value system approach. Okay. Uh, the lady from there. Uh, no, no, the, the lady, the lady, the lady is first. Uh, you're traveling the world, world warning about fascism and yet, you are the embodiment of government immorality. You call mass murder, and I mean Iraq, Sudan, Afghanistan, merely a tough choice. The policies you pursued brought death and suffering to millions of people. The purpose was never peace and positive social change, but money, oil, and influence. Pretending to fight terrorism, you have become a terrorist yourself. You're a disgrace to women, Mankind and hopefully soon and you let, and your it. evil stop, legacy will both end up in the dustbin of history uh, Thank you very much for your kind question and who is paying you to say that? Okay. Uh, Ambassador Schiff. Uh, Madam secretary, thank you very much for your inspiring message first of all uh, we are also here in Poland following the investigation of Robert Miller. Uh, it, uh, investigation of Robert Miller, special prosecutor. We are following all these messages, news coming from the United States. There is a, somewhere in the horizon uh, an impeachment possible. What is the position of the Democrats? According to what I've heard, they are not ready to accept the situation that the president would be impeached again? Um, I think that we are very, um, there have been questions generally about what happened during the election. 
a number of different aspects. And um, I think that it's going, it's, it's a long process, we believe, in the rule of law and trying to have um, uh, an, a fair investigation of it. I think that uh, the Democrats actually don't have one position on this. Um, I have just been on Capitol Hill testifying, um, and I think that there are a number of different views. I think that the man that is now chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, Adam Schiff, is somebody who is very deliberate and careful. There have been concerns about how that committee operated um, when the Democrats were in minority, and he is trying to get various documentation and aspects. Uh, but I think there is not one view uh, by the Democratic Party. I do think people want to know what happened during the election. And so one of the reasons I said what I said earlier about the fact that President Trump was elected by the Electoral College, uh, if he truly believed in the legitimacy of his election, then what he might do is be more supportive of trying to find out what the Russians had been doing uh, in terms of our election procedure, and then working very hard now with Democrats to make sure that the next election is one where our um, process is secure, where there's a question about paper ballots and machines and how the states are working. And I wish that there was more of a concentration on making sure that our next election is safe and secure and legitimate. The gentleman in front row. Wendelinski, uh, Warsaw University. Uh, uh, in 2002, in this chair was sitting Zbigniew Brzeziński. You were talking about him mainly yesterday in your lecture at, at Natoli. And after his lecture, it was a very good lecture, there were several questions, and one of them, why Brzeziński didn't candidate for Polish presidency? <laughs> and the answer of Brzeziński was because I, I was afraid that I will win. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's very interesting. Brzeziński and I were very, very close friends um, in so many different ways. And one of them was what it was like to be born in this part of the world and yet, in fact, be able to have a very satisfying and wonderful life as an American. We both talked about our gratitude for being Americans and what we were able to do for the countries of our birth as a result of being in positions that allowed us to do that. Uh, I do think, and as I'm fascinated that you asked it, I'm about to go to Prague, where they treat me as some combination of a queen and an irritating older sister. Uh, um, and when I was with President Havel on my last trip as Secretary of State, we were, uh, and he was trying to identify me with President Thomas Gehrig Masaryk by taking me to all the little towns that Masaryk's family came from. And all of a sudden he says, I want Madeline to succeed me as president. And I thought, oh my God, uh, I don't understand the political situation well enough, and so I can fully understand why Zbig said what he said, because we used to talk about what it was like to be us. <laughs> uh, right, Professor Poitek, could, could I get the microphone back to her? Thank you. Madam Secretary, I think that you are right that democracy is fragile, so what your father said is true, and I think that it is also the truth that someone said that in democracy, democracy has a grain of fascism within itself. And today, United States, Hungary, Poland, Brazil are put in one line where the fear of fascism is talked about. And I think that there is no comparison between United States, Hungary, and Poland. United States is an empire, and Hungary is the country that breaks all the European rules, but all the changes that were done within the Hungary were done in accordance to the law that is in Hungary, while Poland is the country that breaks its own constitution while breaking the whole system. But my question is, so each of those, I know too little about Brazil to talk about it, but my question is, if you would look back what are the problems, what are the mistakes that were done before 
in the United States that needs to be repaired and improved in order to protect the country from actual fear and possibility of fascism within the United States? Well, I, I do think that, um, and, and as I said, I was going to write my book, no matter who had won the election, because um, as, as a political scientist, I was beginning to see that there were divisions in America. When we came to the United States in 1949, America was very much a middle-class country. It was very clear. Um, and uh, there seemed to be a way that people were able to make a living, live in some calmness. What was happening more and more in the United States, I think a real, there are poor people in the United States, very poor people. Um, there are issues uh, that unfortunately are ne have not been settled, which are issues of racism uh, and divisions. Uh, America has thrived, I think, because of its diversity, uh, and yet all of a sudden there are questions about who is in America and why they're in America. And I do think also that there were a couple of different things that have been uh, very important in terms of the evolution of America, and 9-11 was one of them, where I had said that America felt safe behind two oceans, and all of a sudden there was a fear factor that had developed. But I think that the aspect that, one, that Americans have to deal with are that there are very serious divisions in the country, and that there were not enough um, ideas about how to have common purpose. And um, somebody that wants to divide the people, which is what I'm afraid is, happens, has happened uh, both in the United States and in Poland and in Hungary, um, has something to work off of. They are not the creators of the divisions, but they know how to take advantage of them to have a political agenda that keeps people divided which is much more majority rule and no minority rights. But it's hard to, ex I, I wish that there had been certain aspects that had been discussed more openly in our last election. Um, and, and I'm hoping that one of the things, as I said earlier, because the political discussion has begun so many months ahead, that people will examine uh, what the problems are in the United States and try to elect people that want to bring people together rather than divide them. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, the time is over for the questions, but now is the time for book signing. And uh, I take the liberty uh, to get the first signature, Madam Secretary. Yeah.